I would say if the authorities didn't want us involved in the public square, they ought not to have crucified Jesus in the public square. Use humanistic principles. Well, I would say the Dan, same idea. Yeah, I would say same that. End. I would say, what's the problem with stardust bumping into stardust? In the in the cosmic picture, no, there's no problem. In the okay. cosmic picture, it won't matter. No, Mr. President, you are not protecting reproductive freedom. You are authorizing the destruction of freedom for one million little human beings every year. I'm sorry, my friends, but I am tired of seeing Jesus presented as a weak beggar. He is a powerful Savior, and the Gospel is not a suggestion, it is a command. Reverend Mola, don't you sympathize with that? I sympathize with every single human heart wishing to know the one true and living God, but I believe there's only one way that that can happen through Jesus Christ, and the Gospel is about repenting of sin, not celebrating it. of an amazing adventure. We will explore the spiritual abyss. You have not experienced this before. You're gonna love it. You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Moloch and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And you shall not lie with any animal and so make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. It is perversion. Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things for by all these the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean and the land became unclean so that I punished its iniquity and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you shall keep my statutes and my rules and do none of these abominations, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Apologia Radio. You can get more at ApologiaStudios.com, A-P-O-L-O-G-I-A, Studios.com. Here in the studio today, very excited about this discussion we're going to be able to have today. Great level of respect for Brandon Robertson for uh, connecting with us and uh, providing the opportunity to have a discussion. I'm uh, Pastor Jeff Durbin with Apologia Church, and that's Pastor James White, Director of Alpha and Omega Ministries. Dr. James White, beard's looking good today, brother. It looks great. But also with Apologia. Yeah, well, I, didn't I say that? I said Pastor Apologia? Uh, yes. I don't know. Yeah, Pastor of Apologia, <laughs> Pastor of Apologia. Uh, and so we are uh, joined today in the show. We're going to get right into it today to have a discussion uh, with Brandon Robertson. Many of you guys have, uh, are familiar with Brandon Robertson, a very uh, substantial um, um, a TikTok account and a social media platform uh, engaging in the area, I would say, of uh, maybe Brandon, you can help me with this. The, the um, I mean, would it be proper to say gay theology, um, theology and homosexuality? Um, and promoting uh, the idea that homosexuality is something good and holy before God. I do spend a good amount of time talking about that, but more broadly, I would say progressive Christianity. But yes, also LGBT theology. Okay, LGBT theology. And so I just want to say publicly, uh, because I mean it, I'm going to speak straight and not crooked. Great level of respect for Brandon Robertson when I saw that he had communicated with us and said he'd be willing to have a discussion. I, uh, I was very grateful for that, and so I am honored to have you on the show today. Uh, and so let's go ahead and just jump right into it, Brandon, so we can have that discussion. People who know you and know us have probably seen the things that you have said and, and know what we've said over, over the last month or so. I think we've done a couple things engaging with some of your TikTok videos. Uh, and so the video that you responded to was this one. By what standard is anybody immoral in your perspective? Because you're, you're trying to create a category of this is good, lovely, and beautiful. And you know what? These people who are doing this over here, they're not actually over here in the category of immorals. We've got good, righteous, immoral, evil. Brandon admits that. He's, he's, he's not saying he's a nihilist. He's saying there's actually something that's good. Yeah, there's and something meaning. that's there's immoral. And he's saying these people that do these acts over here, they're not immoral. Okay, the challenge is, and it always is going to be, Brandon, by what standard? Mm -hmm. Are you measuring whether it's immoral? Is it because Brandon 
Is it because in his little mind, he believes that it's not immoral? Or is it the culture that we're currently in that says it's not immoral? Or is there actually an objective standard of something that is right or wrong or immoral or moral? Is there a standard out there somewhere? Where can I find this standard, Brandon? Is it somewhere I can investigate? Or is, is it a book that I can open? Is there a standard for what is right and wrong? Because you're clearly applying it. You're saying that what they're doing isn't wrong. By what standard? Who says, Brandon? So there you go. All right. And so you responded to that on Instagram. We can have a discussion about it. And so I think it'd be good to start there. What do you think? Yeah, well, I know that was in a context of a broader conversation. I'm not exactly sure what particular video you're responding to. But I do think the question of what standard do we define morality uh, by is an important one. And I do think we all probably start at different places. Um, you too, uh, presumably believe that the Bible is the inerrant inspired word of God. And that is your objective moral standard, I would say that perhaps there is an objective moral standard, but I don't know, I don't believe that we can know it objectively. And um, I don't think that the Bible is uh, the inerrant word of God. And therefore, I also don't think all of the morality that we find in the pages of the Bible is uh, worthy of being followed. Um, and so we have two different starting places for where yeah. we base our morality No, it's from. a good place to start. I'm glad you brought it up just like that. So that video in particular was responding to your video that was calling porn art and saying that it's actually a beautiful and good thing. And so that's what that was about. You were essentially saying it's not immoral, it's not wrong. And so since you believe, because you don't believe the Bible is the objective standard or ultimate standard, um, since you believe that that is not the ultimate standard, and that there's not really any, you can't know any objective ultimate standard, and then how do you know anything at all? I mean, you're making claims about what is moral and true and good, and yet you admit that your system, because you reject God's word and his revelation as a starting point, is that there you can't really know that there's this objective morality. So how do you complain about anything, Brandon? I would say that I would be in alignment with a majority of other people who uh, have, we have a reason, we have science, we have revelation. I do believe in revelation. I just don't believe that all of the Bible is God's revelation. There are multiple ways that we come to develop a sense of morality. Um, I resonate with the language from the Hebrew Bible, which talks about the law of God written on our hearts. I believe that in some sense, all human beings have been programmed with some level um, of moral code. And yes, there is obviously diversity, and we disagree as humans on various um, what things are moral and what might not be moral. But there are a lot of areas where broad swaths of humanity throughout all time do agree on common moral principles. And I'm also of the mindset that humanity led by the spirit of God is constantly progressing in our morality, which I know you all would probably very much disagree with. But I believe every generation we're getting towards more of what Jesus talked about as the kingdom of God, where we have a society of justice, equity, peace, and but, so I see, but you, don't, but you don't, yeah, but you don't know. You're admitting though, Brandon. I'm sorry. Make sure. Just I don't want to. Yeah. I want to make sure that we're at least dealing with uh, one point at a time here. So, um, but you've admitted that the the word of God that talks about the kingdom of God and God's justice. Uh, you admitted that you don't believe that it's inerrant or infallible or that it's the standard, the ultimate standard at all. So my question is, why appeal to it at all? Why talk about things like the kingdom of God and the law of God written in our hearts when you've already acknowledge at the front that you don't respect it, believe it, stand on it, respect it as an ultimate authority. You think that it's um, either corrupted at points or just the words of mere men and not an ultimate standard. So I would just make a point here. When you say, you know, Scripture says the law is written in our heart. Well, the specific word there is the Torah is written within us. In Jeremiah 31, 31, God's law, the law, would be written within us. When Jeremiah wrote that, they had a law in mind and an instruction in mind, and that was the law of God from the Old Testament. And so that's what's written within us. And so there, there's, a, there's an objective standard of what that law was. So yeah, it's, it's now internalized. It's no longer on stone tablets outside of us exerting pressure from the outside. It's internalized with God's people in the New Covenant. That's specifically a New Covenant promise, by the way. Um, but that law is objective. We know what it is. God spoke it. So here's a couple things. I think this is where we fundamentally disagree. Is I think your version of uh, Christianity tries to oversimplify things that aren't actually simple at all. And I don't think uh, it's as simple as you either believe all of the Bible or you believe none of the Bible. I hear that a lot from more conservative Christians. That's virtually not how anybody has engaged with Scripture throughout 
the history of Judaism and Christianity. It's not how we engage as human beings, as reasonable, thoughtful people. It's not all in or all out. I believe that the Bible is a human product inspired by God. And yes, there are parts of the Bible where I believe God's revelation comes true or comes through clearly. Uh, and there are parts of the Bible that are clearly immoral and wrong and should be According rejected. to who? You don't believe there's an objective standard, though. You said that you can't know it. So why are you chastising Scripture oh, about morality again. being— oh, it's, it's it being unethical at points when you've already admitted at the start of the show you don't believe you can know an objective standard, like what again, is ultimately objective in ethics. You're trying to be too black and white here, and it's not that— No, I'm responding to what you said. No, because what I did say is that we can know morality. No, you the said you said that you can't know that there's what that objective standard is, something that's outside of yourself, outside of your own preferences or your current position in time or culture. That's that something that's objective that exists outside of yourself. You said that you can't know it. I think you're forcing me into a category of your own creation. No, uh, I'm showing said, the I'm showing you the inc inconsistency, Brandon. It's not inconsistent. I'm sorry. I uh, don't know what the objective standard of morality is, but now I'm going to tell you that the Bible is unethical. But no, Brandon Robertson's not, first point you're is that he doesn't you're know. To, you're already trying to win an argument by putting me in a category that I'm rejecting. As the okay, well, what's the category you're rejecting? So let's get that on the table so what I can I'm make saying, sure I represent you properly. What I clearly said is that there might be objective truth. I don't believe that we can know it objectively. You said you don't know it. That we might not be able to know it objectively. So do you know it? There are moments where it is clear that humans are united on things like, for instance, most basic command, do not murder. Most human cultures throughout history have come to a conclusion that murder is wrong. How about Stalin? I said most human cultures throughout history and most human cultures rejected communism. Most human cultures look at Hitler today and say, Stalin, Hitler, genocide, wrong. Now, but but listen, what standard do they believe that's not that by though? The Bible. Well, hold on, Brandon. That's not by the Bible. Well, actually, it that's was it was the Christian worldview and Christian truth and oh. God's wisdom that that's that has that no Christian worldview and Christian truth in the West brought about a foundation and culture of say love your neighbor as you love yourself rather than eat your neighbor. Um, it's Christian truth that ultimately did away say with uh, well let's just talk about an e the evils in the last uh, two to uh, 200 years whether it's slavery the slave trade it was the christian worldview that did away with the slave trade um i don't think you can dispute that i would hope you wouldn't try um uh, there are other cultures that abolish slavery as well and oh, yeah but, Christ but christianity abolished on the basis of the revelation of god that everybody is a create a creature of the creator he's the but objective it's a great standard the revelation of God doesn't uh, call for the abolition of slavery. It was people taking principles from the scriptures, not the written words of scripture. If they took the written words of scripture, well, you're wrong them. about that, Brandon. I'm sorry. No. Uh, what does the Bible no, say about the what? What is the, what does the Bible say about kidnapping and enslaving people? There are various teachings. Of no, the Bible. what is it? Well, not you you quoted from Leviticus no, in one of your the videos. The Bible's so not univocal. The Bible's not univocal. The Bible has many contradictory. What does the scripture them. say about kidnapping and enslaving somebody, Brandon? I can tell you that. All the way up through the New Testament, there's an endorsement of slavery. Brandon, you don't know. Huh? Scripture Scripture teaches yes, very know. explicitly. No, I know Scripture. You okay, well, Brandon, well, scripture. let me ask you. Let me ask you again. I'll ask you for the third time. What does Scripture say about kidnapping and enslaving a person, since you know? It depends on which Scripture are you talking about. Well, Scripture teaches that if you kidnap and enslave somebody, scripture it's worthy, it's worthy, of the cap worthy of capital punishment. It's one of the what things scripture? the Christian abolitionists pointed to was the Word of God is the revelation that— gives us a basis to fight against slavery. This man is made in the image of God. We're all in one uh, one blood, and uh, God specifically says that if you kidnap and enslave somebody, it deserves a death penalty. It's one of the things the Christian abolitionists were saying uh, to the culture at large. Um, and so, but but all that to say, uh, the, the main point here is that um, you reject the the Word of God as foundational as a reference point. And so the question no, the is... No, the Bible is not the Word of God, so I don't reject the Word of God. Reject you reject Bible. it as an ultimate reference point, okay? You think that... Uh, yeah, you, you, you have different views on ethics than Scripture gives, and so you no. reject it. Um, well, you it's said that already. I accept yeah. many parts of the Bible. Yeah, some. So, so okay. who, what's just, just so we all understand here, what's the determining factor for Brandon Robertson. So you say you believe the Word of God, you use words like kingdom of God, law of God in your heart, but wherever you dislike a teaching in Scripture, you say, I don't agree with that. Is the Thank reference God point, is the reference point, Thank Brandon? Thank God that I do that. What's Thank that? God that I do that. Thank God that I do that, and thank God many and most Christians do that. 
I think a lot of the positions politically and socially that you advocate for are reprehensible. I think there are many. But you don't know. You don't know there's an objective standard of morality, Brandon. So that's a meaningless argument against no, me. Oh, see again. You've already given it up. If I if I if, no. if if I if I could if I could uh, yes. say something here, when when I first heard you uh, many years ago, uh, yep. Brandon. Um, you still profess some sort of level of uh, fealty to Jesus Christ as Lord. Yes. Um, still do. Okay. Um, can you find anywhere where Jesus Christ took your view of Scripture? Yeah. I think time and time again, Jesus, the way he dealt with Scripture, would have gotten kicked out of first semester of Bible college hermeneutics class. How so? Jesus says, takes the Hebrew Bible time and time again and says, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. And he changes the scripture. So, whoa, 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 whoa. That's, everybody in the audience knows that's not true. He, he did not no, change any scripture. He said, he you have heard it said, and what he's quoting is quotes the traditions scripture. of the Jews. No, he quotes actual passages from the Hebrew Bible. And he does not change the text. Yes, he, he, takes, he takes it deeper. This is, this is where, do you, do you still believe in the deity of Christ? Yes, of course. Why? Because I have an experience of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ saved my soul as a 12-year-old boy, and I continue to follow Jesus and encounter Jesus. I believe that Jesus is God. So the scriptures as a whole are what testify to the idea that Jesus is God, but you believe Jesus is God because of an experience? I would say both scripture, tradition, reason, and experience, all, I would say all of those things come together to lead me to the conclusion that Jesus is the incarnation of God. Okay, so when Jesus quotes the scriptures to the Sadducees, for example, uh -huh. and bases his argument upon the tense of a verb and specifically identifies those words as having been spoken by God, and yet you say no scripture is not the word of God, and yet Jesus says it's spoken oh. by God, and he held... Well, okay. I said some scripture is not uh, the, is not given by inspiration of God. I also reject the idea. I think Jesus is the word of God, not the Bible. And so I reject the way that you're using the phrase word of God. But oh, that's okay. a whole thing. Okay. So um, when, you, when you specifically say, I'm going to follow Jesus, yep. and yet Jesus holds men accountable mm -hmm. for what is found in the written scriptures that were written 1,400 years some before they came along. Some of them. Okay, so where do you get the standard then? That did did Jesus give you a standard somewhere as to how to figure out what from the from scriptures you're going to believe and not believe? The life and teachings of Jesus, first and foremost, are my foundation for my faith, spirituality, ethics. That's where I would point to first and foremost as somebody who follow or who identifies as a follower of Jesus. Now, Jesus, if you actually examine honestly and critically the way that Jesus uses scripture throughout the four gospels, again, he would have been critiqued by fundamentalists. I don't understand how you all wouldn't critique Jesus. For instance, when he quotes, um, he stands up in the synagogue, unravels the scroll of Isaiah and pronounces, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Right. He quotes the whole scripture and then he stops right before it says, and the great and dreadful day of the Lord, talking about the judgment of God. Multiple times throughout the scripture, Jesus would take what I would argue would be a more progressive approach. He quotes scriptures that negate things of uh, that are okay. Uh, about here's, the here's, here's, an, here's an obvious problem, Brandon, a really yeah. cl right. plain, obvious problem. First of all, he holds the scriptures and views them as the very words of God, because he says, these, no. today these things are fulfilled in your ears. Jesus never and then he the stops, of God. and and then he stops where he stops, because that is yet a future fulfillment. There is a partial oh. fulfillment in him. You're making it impossible for there to be such thing as prophecy. Do you believe Jesus was prophesied in the scriptures? What I think, the way that I think you're interpreting that scripture is again not how Jesus would have interpreted it, or any Jewish reader of the Jewish scriptures would have interpreted it. I think this is one of the biggest problems with fundamentalist Christianity is that it reads back into the Hebrew Bible prophecies that weren't meant to be prophecies. Isaiah 53 is not about Jesus. Except, oh, except, oh, except, I'm sorry, Brandon, except, <laughs> except the, for... on the road to Emmaus, yeah. Jesus, yeah. the resurrected Lord, chastises the uh, these disciples on the road to Emmaus. Right. He calls yep. them foolish, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. And then what does it say takes place, Brandon, is that the Lord of glory, the one you say you follow, took them through the Old Testament and all the places that it spoke about him. What was this in all the prophets? You're denying that that took place. Jesus well, first, did that. Okay. 
couple things here. First and foremost, we don't know what scripture Jesus quoted in that uh, passage. So it's a bit of a strange argument to try to use an ambiguous passage that says Jesus looked at all of the law and the prophets and talked about where they spoke of him. But second of all, when we go, when we're taking the Hebrew Bible and we try to read back in Christian understandings, one, it's an ah historical, unscholarly approach to understanding what the Hebrew Bible is. It's offensive and borders on anti-Semitic. So would, the, would you call the writer of Hebrews anti-Semitic? I think the writer of Hebrews is terribly problematic in many ways, yes. Okay, so he did what you're saying you you shouldn't do, and that's that he took the, the scriptures from the Old Testament and showed the fulfillment of Jesus Christ. The Gospel according to Matthew is chocked full in both direct quotation and allusion to Old Testament passages of the fulfillment that Jesus Christ brought in his life and death and now resurrection. He, now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in mm -hmm. the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Do you think that's just Luke uh, throwing that in there and the Jews didn't say that? Yes, most likely. Okay, yeah, so on what basis? There you go. On what basis, um, Brandon? Because you think so? Well, you, you, you no, because you know you would know this. Um, my mentor, my dear mentor, John Dominic Crossan in the Jesus Seminar has done expensive, uh, extensive uh, research into the historicity of the sayings of Jesus. And the broad consensus outside of conservative Christian scholarship is that a majority of uh, the teachings in, for instance, John, are not historical teachings of Jesus Christ. But we do you have do a manuscript that demonstrates that? Where's your manuscript yeah. evidence? We have the Gospel of Mark. It, if you look at the Jesus Seminar in the West Star Institute, anybody who's interested can do a simple Google search. Yes, we all know the Q hypothesis, that there is an external source that's posited that was of the sayings of Jesus that were used by gospel writers to compile the gospel accounts. Um, so, and, yeah. Uh, did you ever listen to the debate that... Uh, I did. Dom and I did? Okay, all right. Uh, wonderful guy. Uh, he really is. Um, and yet the foundation of his perspective is really one that starts with a rejection of the entire history of Christian interpretation of Scripture. So, for example, when we look at, uh, when we look at the, the key passages that f sort of frame the discussion that we, I thought we were going to be having in regards to what the Scripture says on sexual morality and ethics, um, I would I would assume then if you're if you're that radical in your perspective you're making that sound like it's a mainstream thing but obviously a Jesus sure. seminar is extremely extremely radical. That's um, not true. Oh, it is. Oh, it's it's very true. It's very true. Uh, uh, okay, name me name me um, anybody a, a, name me anybody uh, before the 1700s that held their views. The reason that most of the manuscripts that we do modern uh, scholarship, biblical, biblical scholarship on today didn't exist before the 1700s. It had nothing asked. to, Brandon, it had nothing to do with the manuscripts that yeah. have been found. Name, yes. name me, okay, what one manuscript is, is important here? What, what I'm saying here. No, you're, I'm, I'm sorry. You can push Dom, me on this. You're, John, you're win. Domin, John Dominic Crossan and I would probably have very few disagreements as to the relevance of specific manuscripts. That's, that has nothing to do with it. The point is, it's a worldview that has come in that rejects the idea that God can speak consistently. And it did, it's yes, not would, historically Jewish or Christian. You've got, you've got you, to admit that. What I will, I will give you this. I do think you're exactly right to a degree that up until the Enlightenment, up until the scientific period where we had these new methods of understanding and coming to understandings of the truth, the way people did study of anything was in a way what we would consider today archaic and wrong and led to many wrong conclusions. And I do think that is the result of so much of what you all preach is an inability to historically and critically examine the scriptures and let the truth be the truth wherever it leads you to do it. You well, have a presupposed set of beliefs that you need to be true when you engage with your Oh, and, and, and Brandon, and, let's and be honest, you and do. so do I'm you. Say, and I'm so do you. That question here is, is whose presuppositions and pre-commitments are actually in accordance with the truth? And so when you talk about things now, like... What is well, yeah, and when you talk about things like science and you talk about things like logic and all the rest, Brandon, I would challenge you, you've, you've given all that up because you have a worldview that is ultimately, and I'll give this, I'll give this to you. You, I believe, look at the scriptures and whatever fits with your own personal likes and preferences you accept Wrong. and whatever disagrees, Wrong. I think Wrong, whatever Wrong. disagrees with your lusts and all your Wrong. pursuits, that's what you reject. Yeah. And, and hold on, just Brandon, I'll let you talk right after this. And I think because you've given up the scriptures as an ultimate foundation and reference point, 
you don't even have a basis to appeal to science because you don't have a worldview that provides a foundation for science, the scientific method. You don't have a worldview that comports with laws of logic as necessary or universal, and you certainly don't have a worldview that comports with the claim that something is right or wrong ethically. You've already given that up. No, I haven't. And I want to pull back, though, before I respond to that specifically, because the one thing that I've heard from both of you consistently, you more recently, Jeff, and then Dr. White, throughout the years, the videos you've made responding to me, both of you have acted as if I began my spiritual journey uh, with a desire to not have fidelity to Christ or the gospel. And yes, Dr. I've White, never made that claim. No, I said yeah. uh, the first thing I said, uh, and I've said this a number of times when I first listened yeah. to you, one well, of the first comments I made was I heard fundamental weaknesses. And I said, this man will not remain orthodox. And I was right. I mean, you've got to admit that between... That's not a prophetic ability, Dr. White. It's because He's not was, claiming that. He's was, not claiming that. I wasn't I'm claiming... I'm not saying it was. I'm not saying it's a... Pro it was sarcastic, guys. Okay. What okay. I'm talking about is merely the fact that I was, as a Moody Bible Institute student, I was introduced to scholars who are willing to historically uh, examine the Christian faith. Yes, I think it's pretty obvious when I was willing to ask questions and not just fall in line with fundamentalist rigidity and say, this is what's true because this is what my church says is true or my tradition says is true. Yes, obviously, anybody who goes down that path is going to end up questioning the fundamental uh, beliefs of fundamentalist Christianity. And thanks be to God that I did. Can I ask you a personal question, though, about that? Because I, yeah. appreci I appreciate you sharing that. And I think that what's happened, actually, Brandon, is, you, is you've become an apostate. I don't think you started that way. I think you had a... a, a a initial profession of faith, you you had commitments, and I think now you're an apostate because you deny God's word, and and His word is the foundation of all of what is true and lovely and wise. But you, and this is a personal question, you don't have to answer it, but it's yeah. it's you're bringing it up, so I'll ask it. I've watched your videos. You have admitted to struggling with with homosexual desires and lusts before you fell into apostasy. Correct. Yes. Okay. So there was something going on in your life on a personal level, things that you were desiring and wanted that were coinciding with no. your deconversion, your falling into apostasy. First, I mean, I obviously reject that I uh, have fallen into apostasy or deconverted. You, um, you deny I, scripture as the ultimate foundation of life. You are an apostate. You are an apostate. You teach. Brandon, I'll say I this with respect to you death, because you're in I the image of God. I want to respect the image of God in you and respect you and be friendly to you. But you teach others to entertain their lusts, satisfy, satisfy their lusts, things that God explicitly condemns in his word. And so I love you in, in Jesus' name. But you are an apostate, you are a deceiver, I'm not, I'm, and, I'm, I'm, and you reject the word of God. And, and let's be honest, Brandon is the reference point. You are the reference no. point. Jeff, I, I, I appreciate you saying your perspective. I obviously disagree. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not interested in playing the orthodoxy game. You know that. I've we're just bringing, we're, we're talking about scripture. But the way you interpret scripture is not the way the majority of Christians. Okay, let me ask Christians. you this. Well, let's do it. Let's make sure that we're all clear with each other here so we don't get muddy. Uh, Ken, is it is it is it an ethical thing? Is it good to have sex with animals today? No. Who says? It. People do it, we, Brandon. People do it. Go. People people are being arrested and today for doing it. I think Spain. I think, I think Spain wrong. just made. Who said? It, Spain just made it legal, no. didn't it? Who says? No, ridiculous. Ridiculous. Who says, Brandon? But, Why can't I have sex with animals in a new covenant? We need to get down to a definition of sin, which I base off of Jesus's own teachings. I believe sin is anything that harms me, harms others, or harms God's creation. Which verse is that? I base that off of love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as Thank yourself. Thank you for that, Brandon, because Jesus said that those two commandments are Fulfill. what all the law and the all prophets the law, are built the upon, the prophets, yeah. including yeah. not having sex with animals and other men, Brandon. And I disagree. I don't believe having sex with other men, one, is clearly condemned in the Bible. We can get there. And two, yeah. I... Using the basic standard of does it harm me, does it harm another, or does it harm God's creation, which is how I define sin, I would say, no, you can't make a case that homosexuality is harmful to anybody. Leviticus 18, that law that is about loving God and loving your neighbor, Jesus defined that. You say you believe in him. Let's go to what he said. All the law and the prophets would include Leviticus 18, which says right, which in I one verse, well, I'll let, you, I'll let you respond to it, Brennan. In one verse, <laughs> in one verse, it says you should not lie with a man as you do a woman. And the next verse says you should not have sex with an animal. So you uh -huh. like the you should not have sex with an animal, but because of your lust and your desires, 
you no. want to reject the other one. No, because I've actually spent the last decade and $100,000 going into student debt to study this particular topic uh, on sexuality in the Bible. I've come to the conclusion that Leviticus 18 is not talking about loving consensual same-sex relationships in the okay. way that we're talking about it in the modern world. Okay, so let me let me ask, when you say loving same-sex uh, relationships, yep. um, but you don't believe that the Bible is clear enough to actually define what loving is, first of all, I, you didn't use monogamous, Again. which is interesting. Um, so, because most people use that, that as terminology. And yet that Leviticus 18 text is not just about Israel. It's, it, it's about other nations and they were, they were cast out of the land. I've, I've always, since I have one shot here, maybe, maybe you'll be the first person to do it. If you believe Jesus was God, then when he preached and taught, there were homosexuals in front of him, right? There, there were, there were, there would have we're, less than five per, we're less than 5% of the population, James. And well, so, it, depends on, it depends on the generation, it seems, from what I'm well, seeing God. recently. Thank um, God. But, uh, but the point is, there would have been not only homosexuals, but um, uh, transgender folks um, and, and all the different d genders. And all the, there would have been lots of these people. He's talking to thousands not and thousands of people. Of people. Well, they're, but not, they're okay. No. If Jesus was God, he knew they were there. He knew they were there, right? Yes, I absolutely do believe he knows he's there. And yet the he never said a word to overturn the unanimous understanding, because I don't think you could show me anyone before Jesus or for hundreds of years after Jesus in Judaism that understood uh, anything about monogamous, loving, same-sex relationships. They all went back to Leviticus 18. They all went back to Leviticus 20. They all, they all looked at these things in the same way. So no. why didn't Jesus set them free? Because he knew they were there. And you know how saying, far of an argument that is, James? There are so many things Jesus doesn't address, so many people Jesus doesn't address. That doesn't mean that Jesus is making a statement about the rightness or wrongness because he doesn't address a group of people or a certain practice or whatever. What That's not and a all in, in three years worth of preaching, because we only have a small portion. But in three years worth of preaching, Jesus never says a positive word whatsoever. In fact, he says the law is good and the law is right. And that the person who teaches you to, to, to not observe the least of these things is least in the kingdom of heaven. All these things. Three years, he doesn't say a single word to allegedly promote your, pers your perspective. That seems highly likely. We're talking of less than 5% of the population. Why? There are so many things that Jesus doesn't speak about. I, I just don't understand why you would okay, who else, think who, that's a strong argument. Uh, Brandon, uh, do you want, as a follower of Jesus, as you claim, do you want to hold to Jesus' view of the law? Yes, but I think we disagree on what Jesus' view of the law is. Okay, we well, I'll give the quotation, that. Matthew 5, 17, because you were there. Uh, the very text that it actually militates against your interpretation, because at the beginning of that text that you, you tried to quote there about, you've heard that it said, Matthew 5, 17, he says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The word there is menamasete in the Greek. Do not even begin to think. Do not even yep. begin to think that I've come to abolish the law. And he says, like Pastor James said there, that whoever teaches you to disobey even the least of these will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them. Which law was he referring to there? Jesus is speaking of the law of Moses, the law of the Hebrew Bible. Right, the law, law of Moses says that you can't have sex with a man, Brandon. No, it doesn't, actually. Leviticus 18 is not a condemnation of broad, loving, consensual, same-sex relationships. You're adding those words, but the text no, actually has rules no, there right it, before. It has rules about... It? Yeah, I, well, just, I, I will give you something to shoot at. It has rules well, there, know, laws against is, having sex with relatives. It has laws against having sex with other men. It has laws against having sex with animals. Me a deceiver, the way that you are weaving around... Well, I'm, just, I'm laying it down to everyone here, so go ahead and take a shot on it. It's very simple. Leviticus 18 verses 1, 2, and 3 talks about, is, has God speaking and says, these are laws for the people of Israel. Do not do like they do in the land of Egypt. Do not do like they do in the land of Canaan. So what is happening, the list of commands that we have in Leviticus 18 are a list of practices that were apparently common in Canaan and Egypt. Do a brief study, please, historically, about whether homosexuality and uh, homosexual relationships in the way that I'm advocating for them were common in Egypt or in Canaan, and you'll find, no, they were not. So what is and then we look at the context of each of those verses, um, and I think Leviticus 18.20 says, as you already quoted at the very beginning of this uh, show, 
A man, uh, do not sacrifice your child to Molech, for this is an abomination. The next verse down is, do not lie with a man as with a woman, for this is an abomination. Then we go into bestiality. The context is, these are practices that are taking place in Canaan and Egypt. We have no evidence that there was widespread consensual homosexual couples, relationships, families in those cultures, but we do have a preponderance of evidence of exploitative practices. You already know these arguments, that there were both uh, relationships between those who were enslaved in ancient patriarchal cultures where men were allowed to have sex with male slaves, uh, and it was a way of asserting their dominance. We also do know, few and far between in Egyptian and Canaanite culture, we don't know that much about the ancient Canaanite culture, but there is some evidence that shows that there were temple prostitutions. There were uh, sexual sacrifices made to appease gods and goddesses. So it seems based on the culture, the historical analysis of Leviticus 18, that whatever's being referred to in verse 22 is not a broad condemnation of gay male relationships because there weren't those uh, with any frequency in ancient Canaanite or Egyptian culture. But instead, where we do see men having sex with other men are in exploitative and idolatrous circumstances. And it seems to me that that would be something that God would condemn. So, well, so, but you just admitted that we don't know very much. Obviously, you're talking about many, many thousands of years ago, so there's a very limited amount of information. Isn't it right. more relevant that in the New Testament, we have apostles of Jesus Christ, and you may not, you may not even believe that these are words of Scripture. It's quite possible from what you've said. But when Paul writes to Timothy, and he lays out the goodness of the law, and he starts working through the Ten Commandments, when he gets the commandment against adultery, he specifically utilizes two terms, pornois arsenicoites, mm -hmm. sexually immoral persons and arsenicoites. So yep. here is an apostle, yep. and he is now much closer to us in time than yep. any uh, research you might do in some type of, I mean, Egyptian <laughs> Egyptian sexuality was pretty wild. But um, so here's Paul, and he includes and he expands on that commandment sexually immoral sure. persons and homosexuals. So no. was Paul. Inaccurate. I'm sorry? That's an inaccurate interpretation of arsenic. Okay, since it comes from the two Leviticus terms 18. that are used in Leviticus 18 and 20. Right. And. Paul may be the first one to use it. There's one other possible text that it, it's it's disputable, but maybe he borrowed it from a, a Jewish source or something like that. But it's what men do with men in bed. In fact, to quote the Leviticus passage, lies with a male as one lies with a female. So this yep. is sexual intercourse. It's, it has nothing to do with all the all the context around it. It is the actual act. So every place else where we would interpret Paul, it doesn't matter what other, other text it would be, we would look at the Septuagint first for the meaning of where he's drawing his, his uh, theology and his terminology. Totally. So how do you get to something other than what men do with men in bed from Leviticus 18 and 20 as interpreted by the Apostle Paul? To me, this is the easiest question. Um, you just heard how I understand Leviticus 18. I don't think Leviticus 18 is referring to all sexual relationships between men of all statuses in all cultures and all contexts. I believe it's, it, believe it's referring to practices in Canaan and Egypt and that the prohibitions in Leviticus 18 are primarily ritual and cultural, not primarily ethical. So we have a list of things that debatably, there are things in Leviticus 18 that some people would consider immoral, some might not consider ethically immoral. Paul quotes back to Leviticus 18, despite the fact that there are over about 16, give or take, words in Koine Greek that refer to a variety of homosexual relationships, homosexual sex, because it was much more prevalent in the Greco-Roman world, Paul uses none of the words that his hearers would have readily understood as homosexual relationships. Instead, he hearkens back to Leviticus 18 to say, I'm condemning a very specific, unique practice that's taking place that points back to Leviticus 18, not a common practice where there's a ton of other words that he could have used. There are, I don't understand how folks with your view get around the fact that Paul is trying to speak to the broadest audience possible, and he never uses the words that the audience on this one, on this issue, would never 
doesn't use the words that his audience would have understood to be homosexual or gay sex or it surprise it surprises or, you Brandon that he's using a biblical word it and surprises me that what he's condemning is not a broad cultural that he's quoting you you admit he's quoting or, he's quoting Leviticus it surprises you that an inspired yeah, apostle but, sent from Yahweh would quote so, from God's but, words but I think but I think what's important here though is you're the one that said it is your interpretation of Leviticus 18 and 20. Can you give me any contemporary Jewish interpretation of Leviticus 18 and 20 from 500 years before Jesus to 500 years after that agrees with yours? I don't think you can show me any ancient Levitical interpretation uh, from the first century or right before or right after that condemns anything akin to modern, loving, consensual, same-sex okay, relationships. Okay, so, so you are you are creating a category. No. And reading it into history. No, you're reading you're, it into history when no. the text simply says, you shall, you shall, wait, wait a minute. Romans chapter one describes homosexual sex as two men desiring one another. That you cannot not okay. define a homosexual relationship outside that, those parameters. You're the one going, no. oh, it's about these exploitive things. And no. my, my little category over here it's is the one thing it's not talking about. When the because it didn't exist in the ancient world, the concept of sexuality did not exist. It's a 19th century concept. So how can you read back into an ancient first century text something that didn't because exist? Because mankind is still mankind and still made in the image of God and still sins in the same way. Unlike you, we allow the word of God to define those categories. And the word of God specifically says, you shall not have sex with a man as you do a woman. It doesn't give you any oh. little outs Unless, of course, you're like really committed or you're really going to, you know, try to be monogamous, even though that's extremely rare and all the rest of that kind of stuff. It's not um, extremely rare, first of all. You don't know the gay community. And second of all, this goes back to what Jeff critiqued me for last week, which is uh, on the topic of hermeneutics. You said that I was being deceptive because I said evangelicals don't do the historical right. cultural. You don't. This is really? proof of it. Really? The, this is proof so I'm of sitting it. here reading from the Greek Septuagint. OK, and I'm, I'm looking and I'm looking at and I'm looking at the Hebrew and you're saying we're not looking at, at the historical yeah. stuff. You're yeah. bringing you're bringing in your selected external yeah. sources to overthrow the consistent of, testimony. Of research into the ancient Greco-Roman world. And Son, I was studying this stuff when you were still in diapers. Don't give me your 10 year stuff. OK, listen. OK, this is the arrogance that you're just known. For no, you well. were the one you're, that brought it in there, Brandon. You brought in your 10 years. You brought in 10 years of experience. Thanks, Brandon. Brandon, you said I have what 10 I'm years of experience. Saying, I spent $100,000. Pastor, yeah. Pastor James was simply you know, responding to that. You brought it up. And, and you said, I, I, you, you're making an argument from authority. I've spent 10 years doing this and $100,000. Yeah. That's an argument. Authority. That's an argument from authority. You've already rejected God's authority. We reject yours. And so that's, Great. that's, and that's where we're at. And, deceiving and, and the message you're preaching is harming thousands of people. It bears bad. A message that gives life and forgiveness of pe and peace right. to we those who are deceived out. and they are wrapped up in their own lusts like yourself. No. Such no. were some of you no. is what's said to liars, adulterers, homosexuals from that's the New Testament basis. Interpretation. Okay. And, and uh, well, men who lie with men. Okay, let's use the let's go to the Greek sub, the Greek sure. Septuagint from uh, Leviticus 18. Again, men who lie with men, one such were some of you. And cultural context. You, you can keep using you can keep trying to you can keep trying to speak with a silver tongue, Brandon. It's not going to change okay. the fact that the but text me, says what say it say says. Something. Let me just say something. It doesn't say there it. There is this is how you twist scholarship. What you do no. is you create what you want to find, and then you select your sources, and then when you come you to a plain text. That says it's not plain. Yes, you it don't is. Okay, what, is, what does koi mean? What does what is koi mean? What does it mean? What do you What do you know about ancient what Canaanite does, homosexuality? I, oh, Brandon, let's let's try to keep the conversation on one point. Koi He's asking a question. Tell me, sir. No. Tell me. I'm what refusing does, to answer until you can answer my question. About what the does koi mean? Do you even know? Names. Do you I'm even know what koi means? Okay, see. Okay. So one side I, wants to dig into the text and get into the background of the language and the other oh, side want doesn't it, so want to do it. it. So and Leviticus Well, what okay, let's it. well let me just do what what let's let's stick to okay, I'm going to make sure you I'm show you the respect of responding to what you asked or what you claimed. And so in Leviticus chapter 18, you made the claim that these are specific laws to Israel. 
Yeah. You make the make the argument that it's you know Sarah. Verses one through three makes that very clear. Yeah, he's speaking to Israel there, and in Leviticus eighteen, he's speaking to Israel. And your claim is that these are really for Israel and uh, ceremonial yeah. laws and things like that. It's interesting because, and you may have seen this when I, you, I don't know if you watched the show or not, but one of the things I pointed out is the very text that you add a lot of things to and engage in a lot of eisegesis, from my perspective. Um, okay. The very text that you appeal to to say that it's just for Israel says that God punishes the surrounding nations for doing these very things. So not so much just for Israel. But also, if you continue going, and you know this, Brandon, you know this, you're not ignorant of this, the, the chapter and verse subdivisions are a modern innovation. But if you continue reading Leviticus right after 18, as you get into 19, that's where it says you should not steal, you should not deal falsely, you should not oppress your neighbor or rob him. And Leviticus 19 is the very passage that, that Jesus quotes from where he says you should love your neighbor as, you, as yourself. So your attempt to say, well, these are laws just really pertaining to Israel is immediately refuted by the evidence from the text itself. You should love your neighbor as you love yourself. Is that just for Israel? You know that there are subdivisions within the Levitical law. This is how it was interpreted throughout. Now, I'm all reading the text from 18 to 19. And the text has one flow, and it has laws against having sex with family, laws against having sex with men, laws against having sex with animals, laws against theft, laws against oppressing your neighbor, and there is actually a command to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Is love your neighbor as you love yourself a command for the surrounding nations? The command for, yes, that is a moral law. So that one, you like that one? No, Jeff, you're being... Again, disingenuous. I'm reading the text, Brandon. You can no, say disingenuous not. all you want, no, but I'm reading no. the text. This is literally the Apostle Paul's a whole. The Apostle Paul spills so much ink over this. Which laws are ritual, ceremonial? And which laws are ethical? This is not something. I don't understand why you're trying to. Paint is with you this shall love your neighbor as you love yourself? Law. Is it moral or ceremonial? Obviously, a moral law. Okay, so that's the same conversation that you say is just to the Jews. No. So the, so. That's a contradiction, Brandon. That's you do not, see it, correct? No, I don't actually see it. But So it's for Israel, but not just Israel. No, Leviticus 18, verses 1 through 3, God is clearly speaking to the nation of Israel. He says, do not be like the land of Canaan, which I'm bringing you out. Because they practice these sins, like having sex with men and having sex with animals. Don't and be like them. Don't be, that, that, Brandon, you're not helping yourself. That doesn't change anything. Yes, those surrounding nations practice bestiality and homosexuality. They oppress, they oppress their neighbors. They stole. They did all those things. They all did those, and God punished those people for those very things. But that's because those laws are a reflection of God's own nature and character. Those are his demands upon all oh. mankind. And Brandon, I mean, this, I mean honestly, respectfully towards you, I don't know your perspective on the Apostle Paul, but he didn't hold to your position of, on the law of God. Because in Romans chapter 3, after the indictment upon you and me and all of humanity, that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, you know the text, that you know there's none who does good, there's none righteous. He actually says about the law that the law was given to justify nobody, and that it's so that the whole world, the whole world, would he right. be held accountable to God and have their mouth shut. So Paul's perspective on the law was that the entire world was going to have their mouth shut by it. It, was, it wasn't just for Jews. A couple things. First of all, yeah. you twisted scripture. Leviticus 18, clearly it begins, uh, 18 and 19, there, are, there is a very clear break. At the beginning of 19, God speaks again, it says, and then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, so there's a break where we have two different sections of text, two different sections of law code. And we know this to be true, that there are some commands throughout the Levitical 612 laws, which we as Christians have historically interpreted. This is your Orthodox perspective. Some of those are ritual commands. Some of those are ethical and moral commands. The ritual commands Christians do not hold to. The argument that I've made and that many other progressive scholars, LGBT scholars have made that you know, is that when we look at many of the commands in the book of Leviticus, specifically these commands, which are tied to the practices of Canaan and Egypt, that these are related to idolatrous pagan nations, idolatrous pagan practices. These are not general uh, commands about morality for all time. That's already been refuted because stealing and loving your neighbor is is clearly part of that moral command. But I will say it something to you. To you are me. right. Hold on now, real fast, Brandon. I'm going to give you credit where credit is due. You are right. These specific sexually immoral practices are idolatrous. And it's interesting because the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 3 actually refers to sexual immorality generally 
as idolatry. So adultery between a man and a woman is idolatrous. Um, fornication outside of marriage is idolatrous. And so is the practice of men lying with other men idolatrous. Anytime we try to find yes, satisfaction, remember. anytime we try to find satisfaction as creatures and image bearers outside of God's ways, we are ultimately switching God for some other form of pleasure and delight and peace. It's all idolatry. So you're not helping yourself by saying these are idolatrous practices. The question is, Leviticus 18 and 19, because the word and is there, Brandon, it doesn't help say, you. It's the same that's not, discussion. That's not what I said. It's, that's not what I and said. the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the, all the congregation, the people of Israel. So using your, in the text, there's use, a break in using the text. your argument, in 18, it starts with, this is to Israel. Ready? In 19, it says, speak to the congregation, the people of Israel. And there it okay. says, you shall not steal, you shall not swear falsely, you shall not oppress your neighbor, and you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. The, and you know, your, your notice, attempt no, you to subvert the difference. plain meaning no, of the not. text isn't helping no. you, Brandon. You aren't using the plain reading of the text. I'm reading the text. Contextual. No, you aren't. Okay. Because you're not noticing the difference. In Leviticus 18, what are the two reference points? We're talking about two pagan nations, Egypt and Canaan. The context is the practices of pagan nations. 19 does not begin with the context of pagan nations. Are those practices sinful? Are what practices sinful? The practices that are that they're practicing. The surrounding pagan nations, are those practices sinful? No, those are, some of them might be considered sinful, but the idea here is that some of them are ethical, or some of them are cultural and ritual, which I don't think lives up to the standard of sin. Okay. Uh, uh, you said earlier that you're the one dealing with the text, everyone's spinning it. I, I would like to, if we can, in the few minutes we have left. Yes. I want to understand. Kai Hasan Koime Thay Meta Arsenos koitain gunaikos. There's there's just a small number of words here. Let's see if we can actually agree. Okay. Whoever koime the lies with an arsenos, and then koitain, of course, is coitus. This is this is to get into bed so as to have coitus, as with a gunaikos. Now we agree you, on this. Day. Okay, are you are you saying so are you saying that there is anything in this text that limits this prohibition so it does not include where where do you get loving monogamous um same sex coitain? Where where does where does that come from? So this is again, this is where I do accuse you all of not doing good hermeneutics. You're taking one verse, breaking down the words and saying, look, there's nothing here. It just simply says, man, man, don't lie together as you do with a woman. If you take the verse out of that context and just read it as you did it, I would say, yes, that sounds like a broad condemnation of all gay sex. OK, but before Place you go on, before you go on, just I just want to make sure. Is there anything in the Hebrew? Because I was just looking at the Greek Septuagint because more people do that. No, we agree. Would you on this agree? So you'd agree, agree that the 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 uh, technical terms are used for male and female uh, all that stuff is is right there in the text, and we're on. We're, are we actually agreeing on something? This is not. I don't know why this is surprising. I've Yay! Written okay, I, I just, I just, I don't know. We I just agree. figured in this hour that would be something that would be somewhat of a historical uh, event. So we agree on that, and your argument is that there's something else that the, that in the, the context and cultural context of Leviticus 18 places the behavior that's being described in verse 22 outside of the behavior that I'm talking about when I look at my congregation of L that has LGBT people in them and perform their weddings and encourage Why? them to be in loving, committed relationships because the context of ancient Egypt and Canaan did okay. not have loving, okay. consensual same-sex Okay, relations. okay, hold on, hold on a second. So the law that was given by Moses can yeah. only be relevant in the ancient world where you know Canaanite and Egyptian religion and can have no application to today which would mean that Paul completely blew it when he interpreted these oh. words in the New Testament. It can have application. I think it should have application. I think it's against um, exploitative sexual relationships. But there's nothing in, you agreed, we agreed on what the text was. It is, See, this specific, is specifically talking about a man getting in bed to have coitus with a man rather than in the, in the fashion of a woman. 
and, and so the and you agree must be asked by any good biblical scholar uh -huh. is where in the ancient world in Canaan and Egypt was that taking place so where the we, evidence we have the evidence we have of men lying with men as with women in ancient Canaan and Egypt generally is either exploitative sexual practices or pagan idolatrous sexual so you're you're saying that Both you can actually you, you're actually saying that there were no loving homosexual relationships in the ancient world in Canaan or That's Egypt. That's not what I said. Not the ancient world. I said in Canaan and Egypt. Oh, yes, there were none. There. You know this. I didn't say, I didn't say there were none. Well, the, well, but but it's still prohibited whether there's only because you you earlier no. said well it's only five percent so why would Jesus have addressed this. So exactly. you're using the minimalization thing What was thing much here. more common? No, see, you're, you're twisting my own argument to try to win your point. The point is, what was very common... <laughs> we're asking common, you your, we're asking your position. Very, what, no, you're telling me my position and then having me respond to what you've articulated my position to be. Here's the thing. We know that in ancient Canaan and ancient Egypt, it was very prevalent for men to have sex with men. Men of higher status to have sex with men of lower status. Men who had, in, uh, who had enslaved other cultures and people from other surrounding nations were able to have sex with their male slaves. That was a very common practice. So it makes logical sense. And it was perversion, was, right? Yes, that is perversion. What totally. made it, what made, was it only the exploited Lord element that made it, made it perversion? Or is it Say, the fact? Is, is, I didn't hear what you said. Please repeat Was it, was it only the exploitative element that made it perversion? Or is the, is it not clear that in verse 13 of Leviticus 20, the issue is the twisting of creation between the 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 zakar and the isha. It's the it's the technical it's it's the it's the changing of the created order. Isn't that exactly Paul's Paul's application in Romans chapter one when he doesn't talk about exploitative relationships? He says men oh, lusting after men. That's that's reciprocal. You can't say no. that's one man lusting after someone who doesn't want to be lusted after. This was a reciprocal relationship in Romans chapter one. I don't, I disagree. And I. Okay, why? Because Romans chapter one, again, the context of all of Romans one, Paul is describing the descent of humanity into godlessness. And Paul begins with, they exchange the truth of God for a lie, worship created things instead of the creator of God. He goes down and explains how idolatry leads to this perverted sexual practice. In my understanding, like men having sex with men and women having sex with women. Yes, the uh, the sex that's taking place there is in relation to the idolatry, which Paul calls sexual immorality idolatry. Whether it's it's heterosexual or homosexual, if it's right. sexually immoral, it's idolatrous. So can... why 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 do you not see then that the example that's being given by the apostle here? I know what you're trying to say. I think what you're trying to say is this is only relevant to idolaters. But the problem is the example of Romans 1 is this is a twisting of the creation-creator relationship, even down to the point where when it says even their women exchanged yeah. the natural for that which is against nature. Yeah. Are, are you one of the, do you, do you follow the, uh, well, this is Stoic stuff or, or things like that? or Because uh, there's, well, I do as you know, there's probably what? How, how many, how many, let, let's see if you and I can agree on something else today. I would say I've seen at least 20 different ways of trying to explain that phrase from, from the Apostle Paul to get around it having anything to do with the idea that homosexual sex is, is parafusis. Would you agree about at least, at least 20? I'm sure there are many, many ways. And I have a new book coming out in 2024 where I do a deep in-depth study of all of these verses. And so we could, I would love to see your analysis of my approach to these scriptures. But what I will say is I don't, I do agree that it seems the most likely reading of Romans 1 is that the context of that sexual behavior is related to Greco-Roman idolatry. Now, the other side that I'm also willing to concede is that I do believe Paul has a patriarchal worldview. Paul believes the created order is fundamentally patriarchal. I reject that. I believe that the reason Paul would believe that homosexual sex is sinful is because it's a man emasculating another man. It's threatening the patriarchal ordering of society. I think that's a worldview Paul inherits from his culture. 
I don't believe that's the divine ordering of the world. I don't believe that that's the right ordering of the world. But you don't really know, though, because from the start of this conversation, you said you don't you don't really think you can know what that objective standard is. So you're, no, making, I think we're, you're making I, ethical I think, claims against patriarchy and all the rest. And I don't really know what you're what you mean by that. I probably no, would want to get to know you more and ask you uh, what you mean. So I wouldn't want to re- misrepresent you. But we started this conversation with you admitting that because you've rejected scripture at the reference point, you don't really know that there's any objective standard. So ra- you're really just guessing. No, see, Jeff, you continue to re- misrepresent me from the. No, I'm very dealing with your epistemology. I'm no, not misrepresenting not. you. Not. Anybody, listen. Not. There's a okay, listen. Wait, real, wait. One last thing. You, anybody can, Brandon. Anybody's going to be able to take their finger and scroll back to the beginning of the it's conversation where, where you abandoned. I cannot in, know truth. You, I didn't no. say no. And hold on now. I'm saying that you, on ethics, are saying that you're not sure. You don't really know if there's a subjective standard. Maybe that's possible to get to it, and yet, here we go. And yet you still continue to make ethical claims, Brandon. Because we can I've never And you're said, the center. I cannot know ethical truth. You're I've the center. Oh no, I know that you make ethical claims. You're misunderstanding the argument. This is an epistemological question. Well, it's an I'm, epistemological question. I know you make ethical claims. But I'm I saying believe- that you have no justification for your ethical claims because you've abandoned God. That's not true. I worship God. I lead people to God. I study the word of God. I speak to not people. Not the about true God. God. You're a false teacher, Brandon. Wait, you, you need to you need to you need to grapple said, with that. You just that. said you study the Word of God, which I mean, yes. I guess you mean you study Jesus, Jesus or something, but I'm not sure yes. how that works. But yes. I, I just the problem we 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 jumped over it for a second, but you started talking about patriarchy and stuff like that. The problem was the verse that I'm quoting from is about women, and no, it, and the that objection also fits into a patriarchal but, argument. But the obje- the objection is clearly from creation. Not just yes, some Paul type of, assumes, but but creation. Paul assumes patriarchy is the ordering of creation. It's the result of the fact that God created this world to function in a particular fashion, and if it doesn't function that particular fashion, it brings death, and that's which, what that's what we see. Which is obviously not true. Loving consensual same-sex relationships do not bring death. They don't bring life. And in fact, the, the average, in fact, the average lifespan of the active homosexual is considerably shorter than the married uh, heterosexual. That, that's a fact. You know that to be a fact. That's not the fact. You have yeah, your facts when it comes to homosexuals in our lives and relationships are shoddy at best and offensive. Um, Brandon, and- well, let's just deal with let's deal with what Pastor James said to you. He said that homosexual relationships don't bring life. You disagreed yeah. with that? I don't believe that the homosexual of- relationships bring life. I don't believe that the goal of relationship is primarily procreation. No, I didn't ask you that. He said homosexual relationships do not bring life. You agree with that, right? Relationships do not need to procreate. Does life... the homosexual lifestyle create life? I don't know what lifestyle means, Jeff. You're being... You're, Does you're... The homosexual sexuality... We cannot procreate, of course. You cannot. Is... You cannot. It does not bring life. It we does do not, not bring life. Procreation. Your worldview. And, and not just procreation, though. Does it bring life when you brings... have a relationship with someone else that is not Aitzer Konegdo? This is, again, the evangelical problem. When you read into the images and the metaphors and the allegories of Scripture and you try to make them these categories of objective truth. I mean, like Jesus did when he used the same text from Genesis to define marriage. Yes, and he 19. defines marriage. After being asked about heterosexual divorce, he reaffirms heterosexual marriage. Jesus was not making a comment about homosexuals or homosexual marriage. But he was making a comment about God's created order, and that was the point. And I just made a comment about God's created order and used the term, you know what it means, Eitzer Konegdo, the woman corresponds to but is different from the man. That's the relationship that brings life. A male-male relationship does not is not capable of doing and that. I'm not, ta- I'm not, not even just talking, and I'm not even just talking so, about procreation. And what does life, what do you mean by life? Well, there you go. If, if, as, a, if as a minister, and you claim to be a minister of a gospel, I'm not sure where you get the gospel. but The gospel you, of Jesus Christ. Which you can't define on any objective ground. I can define. But if I you, can if define you can't Jesus tell anybody what life is outside of just procreation, there's a real problem there. No, see, now you're mis- James, that's ridiculous. I don't believe that a marriage relationship between a man and a woman is necessary for salvation. I don't believe that that brings eternal or abundant life. I don't I know agree. what you're trying to get at here. I, I, but, I, I'm saying that falling in love with a mirror image of yourself is not God's created order. That is and not it does not bring life. That's not the life that Jesus came 
when he promises to his disciples. That's that's the that's the big thing. I, I believe that I know many, many gay Christian couples that have profound relationships with one another and profound relationships with Jesus Christ. I'm sorry that your own theology excludes and marginalizes us so that you'll never get a chance to know us. And I'm sorry that your theology will continue to perpetuate death instead of life. Your theology produces death. It doesn't bring life. But that's okay because you don't really have an objective ethical standard anyway, so your no claim doubt. there is meaningless. Is, it has, the but you lost your punch. No, Brandon, Brandon, because your words. worldview no. is so bankrupt, it, it's so bankrupt, uh. you make these claims, but you don't realize that you've already lost the punch in strength. There's no oomph to it. There's nothing, because you've already given up morality, an ultimate basis for yeah, morality, I, I, objective I, 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 morality. I do have a question. I, I, we're out, we are we're, out, we're, out, we're out of time. I'm, I'm sorry. So let, let, so, right okay, let me let me let me just ask one quick question. You stand before people in a pulpit, right? Yes. And you have an open Bible in front of you. Yes. How can you stand there and and even get close to saying, "Thus saith the Lord," or say anything that would have any binding Not authority, or have any binding authority upon them at all? Because they can do what you do and simply go, "You know, I just don't see it that way." Do you think that's I hope they thing? do say they don't see it that way. We're all on this journey of trying to understand truth and live in alignment with Jesus as best as we can. But you give it up truth. Believe, I don't believe the job. What of the is pastor. the truth according to Jesus? I, we'll, we'll end with this because I know you're over time. We want to show you respect. Well, according to Jesus, what is the truth? There is that's such an ambiguous question. Well, he does actual it? verse that says it. You're a reverend. So uh, no. John 17, 17, please, thy please word me. is truth. God's revelation yes. is the truth, Jesus not your mind, God's Brandon, word. not your lusts. Jesus will let you, we'll let you go and call you to repentance because you do need to repent, my friend. Please repent of your false gospel. Okay. All right. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you. Peace. All right. Well, <laughs> do you want to take a quick bathroom break? We'll come back and no, just do no, a... No, no. Uh, no? Hey, if the 60-year-old guy... I know. I'm the one that got up halfway during the conversation I to know, use bathroom. I know. I know. Look, because I got it, my two drinks uh, here. That's why. That's okay. Why. So I'm just, I'm just, well, first of all, I'm anybody who watched that is, is going, wow. You know, Brandon was right at the beginning. We start in completely different places. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's, there's, there's absolutely no two ways about that. Um, secondly, I think hope, hopefully everyone has seen that what he calls progressive Christianity is just simply the old liberalism. Um, you know, he talked about his mentor, John Dominic Cross and, <laughs> and, you know, Dom, memories. Uh, Dom Dom's a great guy, but but Dom's not a Christian. He doesn't even know if God exists. He's he's sort of an agnostic. So um, that type of theology is not only bankrupt, but it is it is incapable of ha it has no message because it's it's all completely subjective. You know, it, when I when I debated Dom, one of the stories I told I forget where I got it from. I could look it up. But in the search for the historical Jesus, when you look down the well, looking for the historical Jesus, it's amazing the Jesus you find staring back at you looks just like you. In other words, you make Jesus in your own image, mm -hmm. and that's that's all he has. Right, is a Jesus that looks like him and believes like him. Um, though I did find it strange that that question that I asked, well, why should he address homosexuals? Or, we're a small percentage, and I'm like. You're a small percentage that was getting stoned at that time. And I don't mean stoned as in I right. mean I mean stoned right. as in executed. Executed. You mean you mean you don't have any problem with the idea that Jesus didn't try to bring freedom uh to your your community? Uh that that just absolutely amazes me. Right. But but br we we brought the word of God to bear. We demonstrated that when we got into the text, then it's like that's what you fundamentalists always do. You just try to get into the words and stuff like that as if his overarching claim that, well, the stuff in Leviticus 18 is only about Egypt and Canaan. It cannot have any meaning outside of that. That destroys the New Testament's use of the law. It's done. It's, it's over with. But mm -hmm. he doesn't care because he's not all that big into the New Testament and Paul anyway. He's not interested in it. No, he's so, not interested in it. So in, you just yeah. come up with your, your conclusions, and then you craft things the way you want to craft things. Right. And that's the easy way out. Yeah. That's, that's the easy way out. The hard way out is, is sola scriptura. And Toda Scriptura, mm -hmm. um, and then he still can't help. He'll still he'll still talk about the Word of God as the Word of God. Right. He's he still can't help it. He has too much moody. He hasn't shaken stuff. that loose yet. No, it's not yeah. It, yeah. It, it takes time. It takes time. Well, and, and I think one of the things I'll say two points here. One, do we deal with someone like Brandon Robertson with a, a heavier hand than we would sort of the average guy on the street? And my answer to that is yes. 
And the reason for that is because you see that modeled by the Lord Jesus and by the apostles when they're dealing with false teachers and people who would deceive others using God's name and God's word. They deal with them in a pretty direct yeah, and I sharp think way. Talk, I think if you were talking, in, if you were sitting in, in an airport, which right. I don't sit at anymore, um, but if you're sitting in an airport and got into a conversation with somebody, right. you wouldn't. You wouldn't go after them. No, no. I you, but you, someone like Brandon Robertson is in a different category right, altogether right, that's because what I'm saying, yeah, Brandon, yeah. You because you don't, you, they're not in that position, right? And therefore, you want to seek to graciously, hopefully, open a door for them to hear. But Brandon has put himself in this position. Yeah. Now I don't know that that was his goal. You know, ten years ago, right? Right. Uh, what, I don't think it was a full ten years ago when I first heard him speaking. But there was something, and I, 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 I think I have to go back and listen to the dividing line and find out where it was. There was something in one of his answers. I think if you've heard me say, I was out on a bike ride. Mm-hmm. I remember where I was. I was, I was out near Carefree Highway. I was heading up toward Carefree Highway. There was something in one of his answers that made me go, he doesn't really believe that, and he's not going to continue to try to be the orthodox person he is today. It's, it's, you mm-hmm. just watch. And he admitted I was right. Yeah, he's he's had a fundamental conversion in that sense. And so I don't know that he started off looking to do that. Mm-hmm. I really don't. But that's where he is now. And so he has to be responsible. And people need to hear, you know, when people hear about the Jesus seminar, they're normally like, well, those are really rad. Those are the guys that voted with the different colored marbles, right, mm-hmm. as to what Jesus said. And so, yeah, for him, that's normative. Mm-hmm. For him, that's mainstream. That gives you an idea of what you have to do to this book. Mm-hmm. to make it consistent with what modern people wanted to, to do. And, and, and the important thing to point out to people as they think about dealing with someone like Brandon Robertson is it's the same common problem that you'll see with Mormonism, with the Watchtower, and with these religions that will ape Christianity, use our language, and then deny it, you know, uh, the definitions and all the rest. They'll give you something totally different using the same word. Brandon's there. Brandon says things like gospel. He's, you need to repent because the gospel and Jesus Christ and all the rest. So he's using all these biblical words. But if you really, you you saw the episode, just go rewind it and watch it again. How many times he essentially denied that it has any real meaning or that it should be respected? I think the writer of Hebrews was this. Right. And you know, all the rest. And Paul, well, you know. Paul this or that, patriarchal and all the rest. (laughs) So it's like he can't decide which world he wants to live in. He's got one foot in his old Christian tradition, the stuff that really appeals to him. But anywhere that militates against his his own personal private perspectives or his loss, that's where he'll deny it. Well, scriptures don't need to be trusted there. I'll find a way out of that one. Um, and so you're really dealing with the same problem you do with the cults, and that is that ultimately with the cults, they have um, a, a, a commitment, they say, they claim to the scriptures, and so they borrow the terminology. But what you find as you walk a little further down the road is actually there's this other authority operating over here that is really the ultimate. So with Mormonism though they use our language, as you get down the line, no, it's actually the first first presidency. It's actually the, the prophets, Joseph Priest. Smith and Brigham Young. It's the priesthood. It's over here. It's it's these guys tell us what that word means. Roman Catholicism, same we got two we got divine tradi- you got tradition, you've got scripture right here. And so it's as you press that, like you've said, what ends up happening is that tradition eats up the Bible, mm. right? It's the tradition that's ultimate. Right. That's the standard. Even though the language of Christian language is being used, there's some other standard operating, and with Brandon, it's the same. Christian language, Christian veneer, but as you press, you'll find out, get a few steps out, and the authority is actually Brandon. It's his preferences, it's his likes and dislikes, and that's where we're at. Yeah, I just just wonder how long, because it it takes a lot of energy uh, to do what he does. I just wonder how long before he just goes, you know what, let's not, let's not even bother with this. Let's, let's go for some other, you know, religion or just no religion at all, whatever. Cause I, I just, I don't understand the attraction uh, of all of this. You know, maybe for now it helps the transition. He's still young, et cetera, et cetera. But he doesn't, he doesn't really believe that this is a revelation from God. It's just, well, you know, I, I, I'll read some things and it'll resonate with me. And well, it's, you can do that with the Bhagavad Gita. You can do that mm-hmm. with the Quran or something like that. Probably wouldn't do the Quran very well. Um, I just don't know how long, these folks can stay within even a pre a pretense, you know, because he calls himself reverend, and it's like, but you can't stand before the people of God and say, "Thus saith the Lord." You you go to you go to Luke, recording Jesus 
Moses, Moses through the prophets, the Psalms, testify of me. Yeah, I probably didn't say that. Mm-hmm. Probably didn't say that. Right. You know, because, because Why? Because of Jesus' seminar. Mm-hmm. So most people will never run into a Brandon, but they will run into, sadly, what, what most of our audience will run into are Christians that have been influenced by the Brandons of the world. Mm-hmm. And our people need to be able to recognize when you hear that kind of language being used, you need to understand where it's coming from. Because most, most conservative Christians, if, if we have someone who's converted in our church and all they know is us preaching, they've not heard this kind of stuff before. And they automatically try to interpret it within the, the context of what you and I try to model in preaching. Right. And it doesn't work. And it creates great confusion on their part. It's, it amazes me in social media when people respond to these folks, they're missing what they're saying because they're trying to hear them within the context that, that makes no sense whatsoever. And so I'm not saying that we need to learn really well what this perspective is so we can recognize it, but there are certain fundamental foundational issues that came up over and over again his constant reaction against, well, fundamentalism, uh, inerrancy, you know, and, and, and of course the constant, and no one really believes that except a small little group. Hey, on one level, if you want to look at the broad academy, he's right. Now, in the broad academy, I don't, Jesus' seminar is still way radical left, so he's not right about that. But if you actually approach this as a consistent, divine revelation, the way Jesus did, um, you either have to decide, we don't know what, how Jesus viewed scripture. That's what he just did. That's what he did with Luke. Eh, he, I don't think he said that. So, so we don't know what Jesus, the funny thing is I'm teaching people to know Jesus, but I have no idea what Jesus was all about. Mm-hmm. That's the, the tragedy of that mm-hmm. whole thing. But either you believe this is God speaking or it becomes simply a mirror that you hold up to yourself. There, there's, there really isn't, people try to live in a middle world, but there is no middle world. And you have to be able to hear that and don't let it throw you, throw you off. Don't feel like you have to have an instant answer. If you hear something coming from liberalism, quote unquote progressivism, which is actually regressivism, if you hear that type of thing, just be patient. Mark it down, go, well, that's weird. And then take the time to find out where that was coming from. And what you eventually find out is it's coming from a foundation of unbelief, of unbelief. And so I think the most important thing, just historically, one, one more thing, Leviticus 18 and 20, he's saying, if you do tr- true scholarship, then you'll dig into Egyptian and Canaanite religion. If you go to the uh, prize sermons three, four, five, and six or so of the series I did on the Holiness Code at PRBC many years ago, that's what I did, is I went into Canaanite religion. I went into what would be in their, in their context and some of the perversions, horrific things that were going on. But the problem with that whole argument, and I did raise this point at the end, is that what he is fundamentally saying is whatever was written back then cannot be so much the word of God that it has abiding validity to our day as well. Right. He missed that. He, he's rejected that. He, he, can, and he, he, could, probably, he couldn't understand your argument there, I don't think. But he also probably never got that from the evangelicalism in which he was raised. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's just be honest. That probably was never a part of it. It was yeah. never communicated to him. And most of the evangelicals I know, they're scared of viewing it that way because then you become a theonomist. Right? Yeah. Yep. Important questions. And... Um, what would you recommend? I'm sure a lot of people will see this in terms of resources. Uh, what would you recommend in well, terms of thinking through the, some of the things that he was saying, yep. good resources to have everyone get their, their feet firmly planted on, in these discussions? If, if, you, if you want to especially dig into a lot of the historical stuff that was just, just mentioned, um, I had the opportunity. I'm not, I, think, I don't think I told you this. I had the opportunity on this last trip I was on uh, before I did the debate on marriage. Uh, with um, with uh, Keith Giles, I think was the name, um, to have dinner with uh, one of the best known uh, writers on the subject of homosexuality, 
uh, his book Homosexuality. And now, having said all of that, it's jumped out of my name, out of my head. Help me out here. G- yes, G- 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 Dr. Gagnon. Gagnon. Dr. Gagnon is down in Houston, and I was about to say all that, and then I started trying to remember Keith Giles' name and everything else. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm with you. Robert R- Gagnon. Robert Gagnon. <laughs> yeah. Um, we had dinner at a nice Mexican restaurant uh, down there. and um, Of course you did. Uh, chicken quesadilla? Quesadilla? Chicken quesadilla? Is it? Is it? Look, you need to know that Chips I Chips and salsa? Of course. <laughs> but you, you need to understand, I have two things that I will eat at a Mexican restaurant. Chicken quesadilla mm-hmm. or a chimichanga. Okay. So, so yeah. I, I have a broad. Yeah, very broad. <laughs> <laughs> broad, broad. Broad taste. But yes, we did. So Bob Gagnon's work, um, he delves into a lot of this stuff on a very technical level. Mm-hmm. A lot of the historical stuff, the backgrounds and things like that, the gender binary, things like that. So excellent material there. It doesn't mean I agree with everything that he says, but especially his bibliographies and things like that will give you a lot of information. Yeah, very good resource. Then someone we've had on the program uh, here before, uh, Michael Brown. Um, mm-hmm. uh, he's written a number of books on this particular subject. Uh, the most recent one, I think, was Can You Be Gay and Christian? Uh, but there was a, a, a queer thing happened to America. It was, I think, 2011 now. It's been, uh, it's been, yeah, it's, it's been, been a long, long time, time, but that book is excellent. A, a very, very good. Um, and then, of course, the debate that Mike and I did with uh, the two homosexual right. pastors, uh, even though a lot of people would say, well, they weren't up on all these arguments and stuff like that. Yeah, but they are the product of the promulgation of these types of mm-hmm. arguments. Um and the same-sex controversy is 20 years old now and needs a major update. But the reality is it focused upon the scriptural texts, and those things don't change. That's right. There have been almost no new arguments developed since then. There have been a few uh, that probably should be addressed. But um, Jeff Neal and I wrote that, uh, that work many, many years ago. So that's, that's very helpful as well. And, of course, I've debated this subject many, many times. Mm-hmm. Um, I was sort of ahead of the curve on it, sadly. But I think the two best debates I've had, uh, they weren't with like John Shelby Spong or something like that. I mean, that was... That was excellent, but really long and just like it's tedious. It, well, he's tedious. That's what <laughs> I'm saying. Tedious, he, yeah. It's, yeah. He, was, he was rough to, to get him to actually answer anything. I think the fastest moving and, and best debates I've done were the ones in South Africa. That's with, what I was going to suggest. Graham Codrington yes. is his name. Yeah. Um, and because he's he's globally known and he's a he's a full time speaker. That's what he does. He mm-hmm. travels the globe speaking. So he's a he's a good speaker. So I'd recommend folks listen to those that was a fruitful well. one. Yeah, for people to like to actually say, okay, I'm I'm following what's going on. It's it stays constantly engaged, and you're you're definitely dealing with each right. other. Whereas Spung, that was a tough one. Oh, I could give you a lot. We could sit here for quite some time, but I have to take my wife to the airport. Okay, so right on. Uh, we could All t- right, we'll t- we'll, do, we'll 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 someday we'll do we'll do a, a dividing line apology of radio mashup where we do nothing but all funny stories I've learned in over 180 debates. Okay, um, that would sort of be fun. Let's do it. Let's because do some it. Some of them I was doing when you were quite young. Oh yeah, I know, I know. That's Dr. James White, guys. Pastor of Apologia Church. See, I did say it. There you go. Okay. And uh, aomen.org is where you guys go to get connected to Dr. White. Also go to Alpha and Omega Ministries on YouTube and across all the platforms. And you guys can go to apologiastudios.com to go sign up for all access to help provide um, um, the the support to do things just like this on a regular basis. So thank you guys so much. Apologiastudios.com. Catch you guys next time.